in San Francisco, but we'd also like to thank Brenda Sue in Highland, California, Averill in Vancouver, and a big thank you to Pat M in Arlington, Massachusetts. So thank you for filling up the fridge this week, guys. If you want to buy us around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. Thank you for the tasty treats. We got a little project we're working on, but we can't really let the cat fully out of the bag. But a big shout out to Emma. And uh, once we can, you know, tell the listeners more about what we're working on, we'll, we'll get to that one day, right? Yeah, big shout out to Emma. So, cat, how much of the cat is out of the bag? Just like the head of the cat, or the no, tail? no, it's like it's like just a little claw of the cat. Okay. That's it. Are you gonna feed the cat? Oh, somebody has to feed the cat. Yeah, it keeps the mice away from the garage. For anything True Crime Garage or everything True Crime Garage, go to truecrimegarage.com. Follow us on social media: Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Check out our our YouTube page out at True Crime Garage uh, TV. This week, Captain, we're talking about the Black Dahlia. Now, this was a case that we got a ton of listener requests. So we thought we would dive right in. You and I know quite a bit about this case, but we thought we would check in with our good friend Mark out in California. Why? Because he knows everything Black Dahlia. Now, he spent over three years studying this case, working on writing a screenplay and putting together a book. Mark has worked in Hollywood for years, so he knows the area and he knows this case. All right, people, let's grab a chair and grab a beer and let's listen into our conversation and talk some true crime. Mark, would you tell us how you got interested in the case of the Black Dahlia? Yes, well, it was about uh, 30 years ago, 1986. I uh, I worked in the movie business doing uh, makeup effects. And I was uh, doing a film called Nightmare on Elm Street 3, and I flew a friend named Brian Tausick out from New York to work with me on it. The film got delayed, and we decided to visit some friends out in Arizona working on a film since we had a little free time. And uh, we got a late start, and we took off. And so we're driving through the Arizona desert in the middle of the night talking about mysteries and true crime and all that. Uh, we, we talked about the Zodiac Jack the Ripper, which I'd read a lot of books on, so I knew a fair amount about that. And then Brian told me about the Black Dahlia, and I'd, I'd heard the name, but I, I didn't know anything about the case. And so he told me about it a little bit. I was very intrigued. We got back to L.A., to Pasadena, went pretty much straight to the Pasadena Library and started going through the old microfilms of the L.A. Times uh, from January 1947, getting a background on the case, and uh, I was getting further intrigued. I do remember at the time, Brian had a, a, an obsession with three things, which was was Elizabeth Short's hair henned. He was obsessed about the key questions, the three questions that the detectives kept secret to uh, uh, differentiate between the real killer and all the, the confessors. And he, he felt also strongly that it would be great to contact uh, Fianus Brown, who was one of the two lead detectives on the case. Long story short, uh, Brian returned after the film to New York. I was still intrigued with the case. I read Elroy's book. In fact, I was so intrigued with the case, I got a pre-publication copy and sent to me right from the publishers. And I read it in one sitting. And uh, Elroy's a great novelist. I love many of his books, The Big Nowhere and all the others. But I was frustrated at the end because I, uh, I was looking to his book for answers, and it was it was all fiction. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Long story short, I'm, I'm not going to use that phrase anymore because a lot of these are long stories short. <laughs> Cut to three years later, I'd uh, finished writing my first screenplay with my friend Phil Nutman, and I really loved the process. And when Phil left back to New York, I decided to, to write one myself, and I was like three months into this science fiction piece, and my heart wasn't in it. I was frustrated. My girlfriend came to the door of my office, and I told her, hey, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck here. And she goes, what's what's the topic? What's the subject you're really passionate about? And you can stick with for a year. And I looked at her and said, the Black Dahlia. And she took off. She worked in the film business as well. She went off to another state. Shortly afterwards, and I had free time on my hands, and I decided to uh, start my research in a serious manner. I found that the uh, University of Cal State Northridge had all the uh, old Herald Examiner newspapers on file. 
Mm-hmm. So I made the, the long trek out there and got uh, hundreds and hundreds of everything from January and February into March of 1947. Came back to my place, uh, spread these Xerox pages all over my living room floor and taped them all together. So I essentially had all the newspaper accounts of the case. And that's kind of where it really started. I, you know, my intention was to write a screenplay about the case. I thought I'd do, you know, two or three months of research and reading. So I came back and uh, spread all the uh, Xeroxes on my living room floor, taped them together, uh, read all night long about the case. And my intention at the time was to do, you know, two or three months of research and write a screenplay. I had no idea that this would become a, a three-year adventure. Yeah, and once you, kind of, as, as soon as you uh, think you get a hot lead, it ends up just leading to another another thing to chase and another thing well, to follow. It, you know, it, they, they all start off innocently enough, but the one thing I noticed in reading the newspaper accounts of the first two or three months is uh, just what a complex case this was and how many people were involved. And you kind of get a sense of that reading the newspapers, but once you really dive into investigating the case, it becomes, it just kind of explodes out in all directions. Um, very big case. Uh, so everybody, you had already mentioned that the Black Dahlia's real name is Elizabeth Short, and she was not from the area. Um, I believe she was from Massachusetts. Um right. Tell us where she's from and, you know, where she comes from and how she ended up in L.A. and how she got there when she arrived. Okay. I'll get right into that. We'll call this background. Okay. So Elizabeth Short was born on the 29th of July, 1924. Uh, Her birthday was last week. She would have been 92. She was born in Hyde Park, Massachusetts, and uh, raised in Medford by her parents, Phoebe and Cleo Short. She was the middle of five sisters, Virginia, Dorothea, Elizabeth, Eleanor, and Muriel. And uh, right around the time of the Big Depression starting uh, in 1930, Cleo, the father, abandoned the family. Uh, In fact, he left his car by a bridge, apparently, you know, hoping that people would think he committed suicide. Now, in 1940, when Elizabeth was 16, she went to Florida to escape the cold weather. She'd had uh, asthma and lung, lung problems. In fact, she had lung operations. So her mother sent her every year during the winter months to Florida and then back up to Medford for the rest of the year. In 1942, when she was 18, her uh, father suddenly resurfaced. He was alive. And he sent money to Elizabeth to visit him in Vallejo, California, which is up by San Francisco, Oakland area. Um, she stayed with him for a short while. Then they... Uh, moved down to L.A. I should point out that, um, you know, back then, when you're going from the East Coast to the West Coast, you weren't normally flying. Airlines, uh, the airline industry was not what it is today. If you went from Med- Boston or Medford to Oakland, San Francisco, anywhere, it was usually by train. So it was kind of, you know, a big deal. It took many, many days to cross the country. Yeah. So she came out in... Uh, 1942, to be with the father, um, they moved briefly, briefly to L.A. Uh, end of 42, early 1943. Um, but she split after uh, arguments with her father that she didn't take care of the place. She was always out dating men. And uh, January 1943, she went up to Camp Cook, which is a military base. Um, and I know that she seemed to have a thing for men in uniform from what it, right. from what my research was. In January 1943, she went uh, northwest from L.A. to Camp Cook, which is a military base uh, on the coast there. And she worked at the uh, PX, Post Exchange, as a clerk. She was voted Camp Cutie or Cutie of the Week. Um, and she had a thing for men in, in uniform, as, as a lot of girls at that time did post-war. Or actually, this during the war, not post-war yet. And most of the 40, 1943 she was in cities around that area around Camp Cook. And in September, she was arrested in a Santa Barbara restaurant for uh, being a minor where liquor is served. Now, Elizabeth Short didn't drink, but she was in, in the place since she was underage. 
Mm-hmm. The policewoman who arrested her, a lady named Mary Unkeper, uh took her in after uh, booking her for the arrest, took her into, into her house for nine days. Uh, they got to know each other, and Mary, the policewoman, bought Elizabeth a bus ticket back to the East Coast. And they wrote a few letters. So two things to note here. One thing uh, is the rose tattoo on her left thigh, Elizabeth's left left thigh. Uh, Mary Unkefer in her newspaper interviews did mention that she'd seen this, that Elizabeth liked to sit where she could uh, kind of pose and show off this rose tattoo above her knee. That's Second interesting. I had heard the rumor that of of a tattoo similar to that, but only only rumor of that. Well, the, yeah. Later on, people talked about the rumor as if it didn't exist. But uh, when a policewoman is quoted in the newspapers as having seen it, I think that uh, definitely is something to listen to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the well, other thing is, go ahead. No, no, continue. No, the other thing that's important uh, is at this point uh, they had her fingerprints. She was fingerprinted, obviously, during the arrest, but she was also fingerprinted at Camp Cook because that was a military job. So automatically your fingerprints are set, put on file and sent to the FBI for the database. What were you going to say, now, Nick? I was I was going to ask you about the uh, to take us to the days or maybe the week uh, leading up to uh, – her discovery in January. Okay, in 1943, her fingerprints were taken. Um, she had a lot of a uh, she had a wander lot. She was doing a lot of back and forth between Florida uh, and Medford. And in 1944, she was in Florida and met the first of her romances, a guy named Gordon Fickling, uh, a soldier. And she met another guy uh, the same year named Matt Gordon, an Army flyer. In fact, when uh, after she died, they found a lot of love letters in her suitcases. Many were unmailed. Um, after VJ Day, which is Victory Over Japan Day, she got a telegram that Matt Gordon, uh, one of her first serious romances, was killed in the air crash in India. Um, in April 46, uh, she left Medford for the last time uh, en route to L.A. via Chicago. And I don't know if you've ever read this, but there are uh, as mentioned, that she had an interest in the uh, 1946 murder of a six-year-old girl in the Chicago suburb. Have you heard about this, Susan Degnan? Yeah, I have. Okay, it's. I don't know if I, if I want to get into it too much because I haven't confirmed it, but uh, apparently when she was in Chicago, she posed as a reporter uh, and looked into the, the murder, which had happened a year before. I'd, I'd have to look into it myself. She went to Chicago, to Indianapolis, and then off to Los Angeles, uh, arriving in the summer of 1946. And at this point, uh, back in 1989, I was reading every everything I could on the case, all the old newspaper clippings. There were a few books, not like there is today, mostly sections of books. I was outlining my screenplay, and I decided to to ring up the producers of a TV movie, 1975 TV movie called Who is the Black Dahlia? I thought it might be interesting to get a VHS tape. Um, They didn't have one. And I'd never seen the movie. And actually at that point, I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't watch it. I don't want to be influenced. And a little little odd note is I'd worked with Rodney Cox, the actor who played Finest Brown, one of the detectives in that film. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, I couldn't... uh, couldn't get a hold of a copy of that, and uh, I'm doing some serious research here, and I thought it'd be great to speak with some of the people involved, if they were still alive, and if I could find them. And uh, in April 1990, I sent the first of my inquiry letters to the LAPD Personnel Division. Now, I knew that two of the lead investigators in the Black Dahlia, uh, uh, Harry Hansen, one of them, had died. Uh, I didn't know Finest Brown, the other one was still alive, so the first letter went to him. And I went back to the newspapers and, you know, got names of, uh, you know, LAPD officials who seemed like they might know something. One was named Paul Freestone. He was the uh, University Division of Watch Commander and one of the first guys at the crime scene. So the second letter went out to him. 
And uh, I also left a phone message with Detective John St. John, uh, who was actually still in charge of the, op- the still open case. Uh, he'd been on it since around 1980, legendary detective, uh, uh, the most seniority on LAPD badge number one. So I sent those two letters off to Freestone and Brown and waited for a phone call from St. John. So back to 1946, uh, Elizabeth Short arrived in California. She first arrived in Long Beach. Um, a few days after an Alan Ladd Veronica film was released in the L.A. area, that was called The Blue Dahlia. Um, she and Gordon Fickling, her earlier romance, lived together for a while in a hotel there. They moved briefly to Hollywood, and then he had to leave. I'm not sure if they split up or if it was his military service or whatnot. But she uh, made her way to Hollywood. She uh, She's pretty much spent the last five to six months of her life in Hollywood, staying at various motels or rooming houses for girls, a lot of these different places. Um, there's been talk or question of whether she was really either interested in acting or not. Um, all the, the accounts you read say, oh, she was an aspiring actress. Well, there's actually not too much evidence of that. A few people who knew her have mentioned it, but uh, it didn't seem like a, a serious pursuit of hers. Um, when she was in Hollywood, she uh, roomed with a, a woman named Ann Toth. And Anne Ann was in the film business. Uh, she worked as a stand-in and an extra. And the only thing she said about uh, Elizabeth Short's aspirations to becoming an actress was, quote-unquote, she used to hang around at NBC at Sunset and Vine waiting to be discovered. We'll get right back to Nick and Mark after this quick beer break. I love audiobooks, and that means I love audible.com. They have a free app that works on iPhones, iPad, Android, and Windows Phone. Download their app, and with Audible, you can own your books. So you can access your books anytime, anywhere. At the gym, on your commute, anytime, anywhere. Sometimes your favorite podcasts don't put out enough material, so you need something else to listen to. You're exactly right, Captain, and that's why I've been listening to Adnan's Story, The Search for Truth and Justice After Serial by Rabia Chaudhry. It would be cool to get Rabia on the show sometime. Yeah, because she's going to have a lot to talk about. For those of you that don't know, if you were living under a rock for the past few years, Adnan Saeed was convicted and sentenced to life plus 30 years for the murder of his ex-girlfriend, Heyman Lee, a high school senior in Baltimore, Maryland. Rabia contacted a producer from This American Life in hopes of finding a journalist who would shed light on Adnan's story. In 2014, this investigation and story turned into Serial, an award-winning podcast. But Serial did not tell the whole story. No, 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 my friend. They did not. Yeah, in this book, Rabia presents new evidence and a potential new suspect, indicating that Hay was killed and kept somewhere for almost half a day. And right now, just for listeners, Audible.com is offering a free 30-day trial membership. Free? Yeah, Go to audible.com slash garage today to start your free trial. We are very excited and honored to have audible.com as a sponsor of True Crime Garage. Yeah, so go to audible.com slash garage today to get your free 30-day trial. I got a great mattress. What kind of mattress? I got a Casper mattress. I've heard of these guys. Yeah, I took my old mattress out of the master bedroom because you know you're supposed to actually replace these things every now and then yeah because they're full of old farts and dead skin yeah so i moved that thing into the guest bedroom Mm -hmm. redoing the guest bedroom now my friends can sleep on the old mattress the farty mattress i have a fantastic queen size casper mattress in the master bedroom now queen size that's kind of fancy you should have went with the twin size so you and your wife could get all snuggly Well, you know what? The best thing about this thing was, you know why people put off buying a mattress? Because you have to go to the store. You have to pick one out. They're way overpriced. You have to borrow a truck from a friend or a loved one to haul this big giant mattress back to your house. Not with Casper. This thing was delivered for free to my home. And it showed up in a box. This box that I thought, no way is there a queen size mattress inside this box. Mm -hmm. I pull it into the house. I open up the box. And this mattress just starts growing. It almost knocked me over. It was crazy. Well, it doesn't take much, Twigman. I'm working on these arms, okay? So how did you hear about Casper mattresses? I was reading Time Magazine, and they named it one of the best inventions of 2015. 
They say that it combines springy latex with supportive memory foams that create an award-winning sleep service with just the right sink and just the right bounce. Guess what? I just won up to you because I just ordered a king-size Casper mattress. Well, that makes sense because they're so affordable. Try Casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and they'll refund your money. These things are made in America. Get $50 towards any purchase by visiting casper.com slash garage and using offer code garage. That's casper.com slash garage. Sleep tight. Thing is, with I agree with you um, about the wanting to be an actress and uh, kind of chasing that. There, there is very little to to that. There's when you really start looking at her life and her movement. There's not a lot to support that she was dying to get into the film industry. And it, you know, when they say she was hanging around or hanging out waiting to be discovered, she seemed to be somebody that kind of just hung around and hung out at a lot of different places, um, that she was pretty social and it may have just been another one of her hangouts, uh, in my opinion. Now, one of the people she, uh, roomed with, uh, in Hollywood, is a guy named Mark Hansen. Now, yeah, this is a house on Carlos Avenue, right near the, the corner of Gower, where actually another famous case in L.A. would happen in 1963, the Onion Field. Anyway, Mark Hansen was the co-owner of a place called the Florentine Gardens, a big nightclub with like live orchestras and dancers and whatnot. He was a theater owner. He owned a lot of real estate. Um, he had owned real, or theaters in St. Louis. He owned many theaters in L.A., he started a place called the Mark Howe Theater in 1925 with a silent film actress, Alice Cal- Calhoun. The name Mark Howe was a contraction of their first names, Mark and Alice. Now, most of the time she was in rooming houses, and they had a pretty much a five-day limit at, at that time for, like, hotels and whatnot. Um, a lot of the apartments were called hotel apartments where you could stay longer term. But at this time, Elizabeth Short was uh, hopping around an awful lot, and the at this point, you know, I can see why it became confusing to the police because everything starts to get murky. Now, in her times in Medford, in Florida, she had jobs as a waitress usually. In L.A., in Hollywood, uh, uh, as far as I can find out, she never had a job. But she was here about, about six months, and she was dating a lot of men. And... uh that was one of the reasons the case became so hard to solve is because she, she knew so many men and she dated so many men. Um, Ann Toff would tell me later when I interviewed her, quote unquote, and Betty was always getting herself into hot water. She'd come home crying because some guy roughed her up. She'd just want me to hug her and tell her it was going to be all right, end quote. Um, during this time, staying in roomy houses and whatnot, she spent about Three weeks, I believe, in November 46, and uh, a week and a half in October. I'm not sure. Uh, back and forth to Mark Hansen's house, where she would live for several weeks at a time, and that's where Ann Toth lived. They were roommates, friends. I don't know if they actually stayed in the same room together. I believe they might have had their separate rooms. Um, Mark Hansen was a very interesting guy. Uh, he was 56, 34 years, Elizabeth Short Sr., and uh, he definitely had a thing for her from what they found out in the beginning, uh, what came out later, what I found out from Ann Toth. Uh, I'll get into that uh, in a little bit because it's, uh, I want to talk about him quite a bit. Mm-hmm. One thing I should point out when, when she was dating all these men and you know somehow able to pay rent in these rooming houses and whatnot is it, it appears she was, you know... Um, like many girls at that time, you know, you're having a date with a soldier, a smiling woman, and it's pretty easy to get a free dinner. Um, but a lot of newspapers came out and books later and uh, false accounts of prostitution. Those were rumors. That was all BS. There was no evidence of this whatsoever. She went out on a lot of dates. She knew a lot of men, and there were hundreds of them, and the police had to check them all out. But in all of their interviews with the men that she dated, Hanson and Brown found only three men who'd had sex with her. And uh, I did ask Ann Toth about the prostitution. And in her words, she flat out said, 
absolutely not. She said Betty was a decent person. She didn't smoke. She didn't drink. Heck, she never even chewed gum. Um, so the impression I get is just a, kind of a nomadic uh, wanderer. Um, it is interesting she had no job during that time. Um, but there's a, she's very secretive. That, that's one of, the, one of the other difficulties of this case is she was very secretive. Um, she wrote letters to her mother, I think, twice a week. Uh, her mother is quoted in the papers at the time as saying, I had no idea if she was having difficulties. Her letters were always cheerful. She was ambitious and full of life. So around this time, uh, during her five or six months in Hollywood, uh, staying at a lot of rooming houses, she was always back and forth to Mark Hansen's house. And they clearly had a relationship. Now, what would come out later with Mark Hansen being interviewed by the police, who's very, very cagey, very, uh, kept things close to the bone. He, he claimed that, uh, you know, he didn't think too much of her, but when you uh, read the statements of Ann Toth and others, Ann Toth's boyfriend, Leo, uh, Mark Hansen really, quote-unquote, had a yen for Betty, in fact, and came out later and said it, it was almost as if he wanted to possess her. Now, a lot of the girls at Mark Hansen's house, uh, you know, I suppose some were dancers at the Florentine Gardens, and the talk was that, you know, girls that stayed there, he would come on to, but he had a really uh, particular thing about Elizabeth Short. Now, early December, around the 8th, um, Mark Hansen dropped her at the Chancellor Apartments, and he told police later that was the last time he saw or spoke with her, December 8th. Now, all of a sudden, Elizabeth Schwartz makes a... a, a this, this part of the case is kind of what I consider like this weird shift. She goes from five or six months in Hollywood just kind of drifting around to all of a sudden going to San Diego, um, where she apparently knew nobody. And uh, she showed up, uh, took a bus down, and ended up sleeping overnight in the Aztec Theater. And a uh, young girl that worked there named Dorothy French felt sorry for her and took her into her home with her and her mother, Elvira French. So Elizabeth's last month uh, was spent pretty much in San Diego. She dated quite a bit. One guy she uh, dated was a guy that picked her up on a street corner. Uh, she was walking along. Apparently, he was driving. A guy named Robert Manley, nicknamed Red, because he had red hair. Now, in sometime in December, they dated, and uh, Robert was a married guy. His wife had just had a baby. He claimed in later, uh, uh, later in the newspapers that, uh, you know, he just thought he'd pick up this girl to test himself to see if he really loved his wife or not. And uh, like I said, had some problems after the baby. So they dated in December. And uh, at some point, you know, she was staying with Elver and Dorothy French a month. She wrote her mother saying that she was working at the Naval Hospital, which she wasn't. Uh, Elver worked at the Naval Hospital. So she was very secretive, even with her mother. And one could assume, you know, the natural thing, you don't want your parents to worry if you're having difficulties. But she clearly was having uh, some issues in her life. And the big question a lot of researchers have is, uh, why did she go to San Diego? And uh, the circumstances of how she left and why she came back. Now, there's talk of what people call the San Diego Three. Apparently, after a month at Elber and Dorothy French's, uh, three people came to the door one night, two men and a woman, knocked on the door, and apparently Elizabeth Short was quite terrified and insisted that nobody answer the door. Um, who knows who they they were? We haven't found out to this day, but she was frightened. And the next day, uh, Red had sent her a telegram saying he'd be there again and he'd like to see her, and she took advantage of that and asked Red if he'd uh, drive her up to L.A. So they left the next day, the 8th. Uh, he had to see some clients part way, so they spent the night in the motel, which he later claimed was a celibate. And uh, this was at the... Um, was it called? Swallows Inn in San Juan Capistrano. Um, they left the next day, January the 9th, and uh, drove into L.A., and uh, she said at this point uh, she was going to see her sister who's coming down from Berkeley, at, that she was meeting her sister at the Billmore Hotel. At first, he wanted, she wanted Red to 
to help her drop her bags off at the Greyhound station because you could check your bags in there and just leave them for a while. So he dropped her bags off. He dropped her at the Biltmore uh, around 6.30, and uh, he took off uh, back to his life. Now, the last time she was seen, uh, she was seen in the Biltmore from about 6.30 to around 10 or 10.30 that night. Uh, she was seen uh, making phone calls. At one point, she went to the Western Union desk, I believe, to get change. And the, the last confirmed sighting of her alive was the uh, Bell Captain. Now, there's a lot of talk in books like Jack Webb's The Badge, how, you know, she walked out the dorm and tipped his hat and she walked down the hall. Well, that's, that's not true. What happened was... Uh, the bell captain saw her, and he, he'd been watching her for hours because she was very attractive. And uh, he noticed that she seemed to recognize somebody outside the door. Uh, he didn't see a person or a car, but she walked out the doors, and that was the last time she was seen again. And uh, can I cut back to me at 1989 here? Yeah. Well, real okay. quick, though, what yeah. I believe... Wasn't she? Wasn't there a, an officer that believes that she had seen and talked to Elizabeth Short that that evening? Later that evening, leaving the. Um, I have not read that account. Okay. Do you remember the officer's name? It was a, it was a female officer. I don't remember her name. Was it Myrtle something? Because there was an officer who said after after the murder that she'd seen Elizabeth Short, who ran up to her and said, oh, my boyfriend's trying to kill me. Yeah, this was That's Officer right? Officer McBride reported McBride. to detectives two days after they found Elizabeth's body that she had spoken Where'd with you? with Elizabeth Short hours before she was killed. And she had, <laughs> she had, she had said what you had said, that she was afraid of somebody or an old boyfriend um, and well, it, I've I've read that story in uh, Steve Hodell's book. I'm not sure about it. I mean, it seems viable, but I don't know when it occurred, so I haven't haven't mentioned it here. Um, Keep going. I mean, you wanted gonna, to go back to 1989. Yeah, I was going to say before there was talk of a lot of people who claimed they saw her, and they were never confirmed. But yeah, let's go back to 1989, and then I'll continue with the Biltmore. A few weeks after sending my letters to Detective Finance Brown and Paul Freestone, waiting for a callback from St. John, I got a phone message from Paul Freestone. He said, what do you want to know about the Black Dahlia? And uh, he was out in Arizona, and he said, if you want to come out, I'll talk to you. And I asked if I could tape record him, and he said that would be fine. So uh, I drove out, I think it was the next day, to Mesa, Arizona. And uh, up until this point, you know, the the whole case didn't seem that real to me. I mean, it was just newspapers and pictures and and all that. Um, but when I met Paul, it, it became very real. Now, he was uh, 90 years old at the time, blind, and his mind was just like a, a, a amazing memory, you know, I guess to make up for the fact that he had no sight. He could remember details of, of everything back then. And he uh, sitting in his chair, he never got up the whole time I knew him. And the first words out of his mouth were to his wife, Grace. He said, get the picture. And uh, I remember that very distinctly. His wife walked into another room, came back, and gave me an a 8 by 10 black and white uh, of the crime scene of, black, of the Black Dahlia, of Elizabeth Short's body, laying there with Paul looking down at her. And uh, it was very interesting to, to, to experience that. And... Uh, before I tape recorded, Paul, I mentioned something which I'll mention now, which is a, a great connection I had when I started talking to all these retired LAPD detectives and officers, is that my my grandfather had grown up with a guy named William Parker. Do you know who that is? No, I do not. Okay, William Parker was the chief of police in L.A. from 1950 to 1966, and he's a, an LAPD legend, very, very respected by uh, all the cops. In fact, they named uh, the police building Parker Center after him. Every time you see Jack Webb and the old Dragnet shows go into the building, that's Parker Center. So when okay. I was interviewing Paul and all the other cops later, 
just by mentioning of my grandfather being a childhood and teen teenage friend of William Parker opened up doors like you wouldn't believe. It was it was quite quite interesting. So uh, I started taping Paul, and he told me his re- recollections of the case, which I'll get into as we go down uh, the story. And I think also by this time I'd found a lady named Joyce Bersinger, or Betty Bersinger. Uh, she's the woman who found Elizabeth Short's body that early morning in, in January 1947. Mm-hmm. So cutting back to January 14th, um, this is a midway... Early in the morning, about 10.30, uh, Joyce, or Betty Bersinger, was pushing her baby in a stroller down South Norton Avenue in between Coliseum and 39th Street. And uh, when I interviewed her in 1990, she told me uh, she was just simply going to get a heel repaired on a shoe, a very normal, mundane task. And she saw some broken glass on the sidewalk and pushed the stroller to move around it, and she, Something out of the corner of her eye caught her attention. Uh, she told me it looked like uh, a mannequin broken in two. And uh, it's it very startling to her. It didn't occur to her at the time. It was a dead body, but it was very strange. And she pushed her uh, stroller down the street, felt she had to call the police and report it. She went to the first house. There was nobody there. The second house, apparently she was a bit... It was kind of registering more that it could be a dead person and not a mannequin. And she was upset enough that the people wouldn't let her in, but they said they would call the police. So the initial call uh, came at the university station. And uh, they sent out officers, Perkins and Fitz, Fitzgerald. The call on the police radio went out as a, a 390 man down or tox- intoxicated person down. And uh, the two officers arrived and saw it was, it was something much more. Now, they get into this whole thing now of uh, all these reporters and cops saying, well, I was the first person at the scene and this and that. There's one reporter who wrote a book about it and had this dramatic account of him showing up before anybody in police drawing their guns and all this hogwash. Uh, but the first, yeah. one of the first people, go ahead. Yeah, there is, there's one report of a uh, reporter claiming that he either arrived shortly before or just after the officers on the scene and that her he had noticed her eyes were open. Oh, that's such a load of garbage. Essentially, it went like this. Uh, Betty Bersinger uh, went to a house. They phoned it in. Uh, the call came in, I think, at around 10.55 in the morning to University Station. They sent out officers Perkins and Fitzgerald the first people there who saw something, you know, was much more, and they they radioed in to the university and said, you, you need to send some some detectives over here. Uh, no, the the reporter you're talking about is Will Fowler, and that whole account of him arriving first, uh, officers drawing their guns, is is just it's a, it's a big lie. In fact, of all the people I interviewed over the years, and there's about 25 or so. Everybody was very agreeable and only too happy to talk to me, except for Will Fowler. The first thing he said on the phone was, I'd charge $1,000 for an interview. By that point, I'd read his book, and I'd uncovered even more, you know, stuff that wasn't true, and I thought, I don't need to talk to this guy. But back to the crime scene, uh, Perkins and Fitzgerald raided in the first uh, Two officers to come out, you know, uh, of any stature were Lieutenant Jess Haskins and I believe a guy named S.J. Lambert. Now, I, I know that Haskins was there because I interviewed him. Um, by this point, uh, the man, uh, the first guy I interviewed, Lieutenant Paul Freestone, who was the watch commander at the university, he'd heard about it uh, and he decided he'd better drive out and check it out. Mm-hmm. And uh, I interviewed both Freestone and Haskins when they were in their 90s. Uh, and what both guys described to me is really what this made, made this murder stand out as unique, and it's why one reason why people to this day are fascinated with it. Now, uh, to unsolved murders, there's thousands of them, hundreds probably every year, uh, you know, in any major city. Uh, if Elizabeth Short had been shot or stabbed in an apartment or downtown or in Hollywood, uh, and it became an unsolved murder. It would have been made the papers for a day and it would have disappeared. We'd never know about her, but it was the way in which she was killed. 
Now, uh, Freestone and Haskins described, you know, what we all know, the body lying there cut in half, not a drop of blood. And Haskins described her as being pale as marble. And she was positioned deliberately with her legs straight out and spread open. She'd been uh, bound and apparently tortured. Uh, and both both men and all the detectives later said it was this she is this she was put deliberately on display, deliberately arranged with her arms above her head, her head mm-hmm. looking towards the street, and her mouth was cut from ear to ear. There were just uh, incredibly vile mutilations involved here. Now, uh, Sergeants Harry Hansen and Finest Brown uh, arrived about 10 or 15 minutes later. Uh, Finest said when he arrived, the scene was already full of newsmen and newswomen. At the time, reporters had uh, police scanners like they do today, so they heard about it and everybody was going to the scene. Harry and Finest were signed by Homicide Captain Jack Donahoe to head the investigation. And uh, I can get into the whole crime scene here and all the details, but I don't know if I. Well, was there anything? Thing. Was there anything that they found other than her? I mean, we said there's not a drop of blood. Um, obviously, she looks to have been posed, and of course, she's bisected, and uh, you know that's extreme. There that's were that's, uh, there were a know, couple of things. Go ahead. Now, once Hanson and Brown got out the. Uh, Ray Pinker, who was uh, head of the Scientific Investigation Division, SID, the crime lab, came out. And uh, a couple of things they found out. There's, there's no blood at the scene. They did find, uh, Paul said, one drop of watery blood, I believe, on the sidewalk. Um, and there was a uh, empty cement sack, which apparently had another drop of blood. There, What they could tell right there at the scene was that uh, there was dew underneath the body when they moved her. And they found out later that the dew fell in L.A. at that time from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., which tells them the body was placed after 2 a.m. They could also tell the body, at least the top half, had been put face down first because there was grass on the chest, as if you put her down face first and turned her over. They did find some fibers on the body and in the body cavities at the scene as well. Uh, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, there was postmortem lividity, which is the blood settling on the front of her face and body here and there, indicating that she had been face down for a period after death. So that's what they determined right there at the crime scene. Uh, Lieutenant Freestone was in charge of the canvas, which at this time was a huge. We're talking uh, city blocks and many, many square miles. Every hotel, mo- every hotel, motel, house, and apartment was checked. In fact, Paul told me, and I'll quote, every morning I had to have an assembly room full of officers. We didn't have enough in my division to take care of it, so we brought in officers from all over the city. We'd strike out in every inch of that area to check every house. There wasn't one within miles that we didn't check. If nobody came to the door when we first went through, we took that address and sent somebody back that night or the next day, and so we never missed a house. A uh, huge canvas going on, asking people if they'd heard any screaming, seen any women's clothing thrown out, are there any medical students or doctors in the house, any items burning and incinerators. And uh, that was where they started out. Now, while the canvas was going on, Harry and Finus accompanied the girl's body to the morgue. They took fingerprints, photographs, checked missing persons reports, and... Uh, got a tape of Finest Brown that his daughter gave me, and he, he said it was, quote-unquote, the usual investigation. Well, of course, it was anything but, and that was becoming uh, pretty apparent already. Now, standard operating or standard procedure at this point is you get an initial assessment from the, uh, the coroner or the autopsy surgeon, and what they found out about the bristles was that they were cocoa fiber, uh, apparently quite a common for like a kitchen scrubbing brush. So her body had been washed clean with her cocoa fiber brush. Um, contrary to all the rumors you read about her being, you know, organs removed and all, all this stuff, um, no, the, uh, they were all intact. In fact, Paul Freestone said the body cavities were full. And, of course, now we get into the whole thing of what type of person did this. There's all sorts of talk that, oh, it had to be a doctor or... Perhaps not. Now, uh, it seems like there may have been a little bit of 
surgical finesse to die, you know cut the body to bisect it like that. But one thing Paul Freestone noticed looking down is he said it was almost as if somebody was dressing a deer, which uh, uh, I don't know. You can get into that. That's a whole new topic. Um, right. At the at this point, they had no ID on the girl, but they had her fingerprints, so they checked the uh, LAPD, L.A. sheriffs, uh, didn't find anything. And it's important to note by this time, you know, there's, all the reporters are involved. Uh, it's been just starting to already become a big case. And at the time, there was kind of a, a race between the newspapers and the police. Uh, there were four major newspapers, the Herald Examiner, Herald Express, L.A. Times, and Daily News. They had, uh, you know, obviously there's no Twitter or anything in those days, but these papers had several editions, morning, afternoon, and evening edition, and that's how people got their news. So the, the papers want to be on top of things, and with the police, the reporters had kind of a, people have described it as a symbiotic relationship, you know. There's an investigation on two fronts, sometimes competing, sometimes helping, and if the uh, newspapers got a, a lead first, they wanted a scoop, and they would, you know, make deals with the police where well, you can have our information if you give us, you know, front page, a photo of you, whatnot. Um, obviously, at this time, they were trying to find out who she is. They checked her fingerprints in L.A. There's no match. So the next step is to get her fingerprints to the FBI. At this point, though, there's a big storm over the Midwest, so they want to, they actually did send her fingerprints by airmail special delivery, but it was going to take days and days to get to Washington. And this is the first time they actually the, the press came in and kind of helped out, you know, deal-making. Well, we can help you out, but you got to give us a scoop. The uh, the papers, the Herald Examiner had what was called a sound photo machine, and that was kind of a really early precursor of a fax machine. They used it in those days to send news photos across the country to the other Hirsch papers. So what the police did was they brought the uh, girl's fingerprints to the examiner, and they took each fingerprint and took a photograph of it, blew it up to 8 by 10 and sent them individually to the FBI. Now, believe it or not, the FBI came up with a, a match uh, overnight. It just took them a few hours, and you'd think, think that's pretty incredible, it, and it is. But I've seen photographs of the, the FBI fingerprint room at that time. And it's like... A, a stadium-sized room with hundreds of clerks and stacks of files and fingerprints. And they did that without, without computers, obviously, by hand and by eye. They found this girl's identity uh, within just a few hours. What, do you know if there was a, a um, heel print, a heel impression found at the scene? Yeah. I think uh, Paul Freeston had mentioned that, that there was a heel print, and that there was a drop of blood on that heel print. But yeah, the whole I, drop I, of blood thing gets confusing because one person says one thing, and then you hear another account. Yeah, I'd love to see I, the, the, the original reports. Those are the ones that are going to tell you, but, of course, nobody can see those. I was. I had heard that there was a heel print. I had also heard that there was a heel print that had a what might have been a diluted Drop of that's blood. what I heard. That's that's what Paul told me is a diluted drop of blood on the heel print, and, which would be which would be similar to the diluted blood that w drop that was found uh, on, the on the concrete sack. Concrete, yeah. yeah, on the concrete sack. Well, you know, not which would, which would go which go along with her being cleaned and scrubbed. Um, well, yeah, you know, I mean it's it's interesting without getting too graphic, obviously. She was cleaned and washed down, and they did find cocoa fiber brushes. And those and cocoa fibers are, I mean, that's a coarse a It's coarse a very brush. coarse, yeah, yeah, so it kind of stick in, in the cavities and whatnot. And according to Paul Freestone, they found a drop of watery blood on a heel print by the sidewalk or in the street, uh, and a drop of watery blood on a concrete sack near her body, so... One could assume that that's from the, the blood is diluted because of the washing down. But we, you know, what, there's a one one graphic morgue photo, a wide shot. You can see that uh, she's laid on the metal table, and you can see two long, very rivers of blood coming from her body cavity, as if that's the remaining blood. Um, you don't have to include that part. I'm just letting you know. 
Yeah, but, but it should be pointed out, though, that you had talked about potential uh, post-mortem bruising to the face where she would have been lying face down. Um, and if she well, were... you know, if you want to... I don't like to visualize this stuff, but I do. I mean, one would assume that cutting a person in half is, is going to be so bloody and messy that you, you'd you have to arrange her as you're washing her off. Mm -hmm. Maybe he put her in the bathtub for a while while he uh, got his car ready. I don't know. It's like, I don't like to think about details like that. But uh, And there there was possible evidence that, that she might have been dragged for a short period of uh, a short I've distance. Been, I've never heard that. You know, but they, when you look at the crime scene photos, they're they're black and white. They've got high res ones. There are you know strange marks on the body. It's hard to tell if they're dirt or blood or lividity. Um, I don't know if the coroner had color photographs back back then. I presume if they had uh, the ability, they would have, and those would tell a lot more. You can tell a lot from uh, from color shots. So the uh, they got the kickback from the FBI. They had an ID on the girl. And uh, her name was Elizabeth Short, 22, of Hyde Park, Massachusetts. Now, uh, at this point, the papers, the examiner being involved, they managed to get to Elizabeth Short's mother, Phoebe, before the police did. Uh, Jimmy Richardson, the uh, city editor, had a guy named Wayne Sutton call Phoebe Short. Uh, and what he did was he called and said to uh, Jimmy said to, to Wayne, get everything you can before you tell her. So Wayne Sutton gets on the phone to Phoebe Short and told her that her daughter Elizabeth had won a beauty contest and he got as much background on her as he could before he finally told her, you know, your daughter's been murdered. Uh, what a nice thing, huh? Yeah. So and the LAPD officially notified but, her. But be Mark, that goes along with your opinion of, of Fuller's story being bogus because back then one thing we should point out it was it was a race it was a, a the selling the newspapers was a bit of a war um back then it yeah. was who, who could sell the most and who could sell them the fastest and if you put you know if it bleeds it leads and and they were chasing the cops they were chasing the ambulances and and they were no you're um, right you're right and, and, that, that's and it was big time competition and it was it was some reporters were fabricating things to embellish the stories and, and make them better uh, to 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 better their careers and to better the the sales of their papers. That's what it was all about. That was the name of the game, like you said. When it bleeds, it leads. And uh, at this point, you know, once the LAPD notified Mr. Short, she began arrangements to fly out to California, but you still had that storm going on, so it, it took her a few days. Elizabeth Short's father, Cleo, was found living in L.A. on South Kingsley Drive. They questioned him. Apparently, he was drunk and belligerent, and even though he was the only family member in L.A., he refused to identify his daughter's body. So it, it, the whole thing starts off as kind of, uh, it, it's not very nice on many, many fronts. Um, of course, by this time, Elizabeth's name and photo has hit the newspapers, so uh, the police started to receive a ton of calls and a ton of tips. And uh, one thing you've got, you've got many things going on at the same time here. The, the examiner is trying to find out who she is, the information there in a race, and the police want to find out who she is. Um, now, at one point, on the, the day after, early in the morning, around 11, and Toth, apparently he'd seen Elizabeth's uh, face in the paper or she'd read a name Ann Todd and put two and two together that you know this yeah this is her friend and she called homicide and within an hour she was at homicide uh central homicide which is on the ground floor of city hall in those days and she came with Mark Hansen uh who drove her and uh needless to say there's reporters there flashing uh photographs of Ann you can see in one particular photograph, she kind of looks like a deer in the headlights. Uh, she's got kind of a, a blank look on her face. The reporters at the time asked Mark Hansen who he was. He was kind of keeping in the background, and he said he was Ann's chauffeur, of course, which he was not. 
Now, in the first 10 days of the investigation, you had literally hundreds of officers uh, uh, from many divisions. You also had a division called Metro Division, which was not an official building or or a LAPD station. It was, uh, it was kind of a floating division. They took all the Metro Division officers, and they're canvassing the area, sending people every which way to, to question uh, all, the, all the people who are phoning in tips. One thing the examiner found out, uh, apparently a little bit before the LAPD, was that Elizabeth Short had been to San Diego after L.A. So they did something which actually was quite clever. They they sent reporters down to San Diego uh, to find Elver and Dorothy French, and they also had reporters drive up the highway north from San Diego to L.A. to stop at every motel and hotel along the way to see if they could find out who this guy was and did Elizabeth Short stay there with a, a guy and trying to find out who this guy was because uh, he was the last, this guy Red, well, they didn't know his name at the time, but Red was the last person she knew to have been seen with her alive. So pretty clever the way they did that. Um, but again, you've got the race between the, the press, the Herald Examiner and the LAPD. Uh, when I interviewed Jess Haskins, uh, he told me uh, when the LAPD found out about Dorothy and Elber French down in San Diego, they sent him. Uh, they were going to send him down, but then they found out that the examiner found out first, and were flying the French girl's uh, mother and daughter up to L.A. So they sent Jess to Burbank Airport to try and intercept them, but he just missed them. Somehow they figured out that they were being put up at the Biltmore by the examiner. So Jess and Harry Hansen went down to interview them there. And uh, also at this time, the reporters were finally lucky, and they found the motel, uh, Swallows Inn in San Juan Capistrano, where Elizabeth Short and this mystery man had stayed for the night. And the uh, sharp-eyed uh, motel owner got the license number of the Studebaker of the car, and it listed Red's real name. You know, they checked in as Red Manley and Elizabeth Short. So now they knew who the mystery man was, and uh, reporters in LAPD showed up at Red Manley's door, and his wife Harriet answered with the, their three three month old baby. But they were so they've tracked down Red Red Manley, and he, from what I've heard, he was pretty eager to speak with them. Is that is that what you found as well? Mm, not entirely. Well, when the LAPD and reporters, uh, I don't know at which order it happened, but they showed up at Red's door and talked to his wife. And she said, well, uh, Red's not in town. He's in San Francisco with his friend Harry Palmer, but he's driving down tonight. So uh, Red was arrested at Harry Palmer's house uh, in Eagle Rock and taken to Hollenbeck Station. And, uh, you know, now he's in the hot seat. He's like the most unlucky guy in the world. He's he's the only suspect. As it turns out, you know, of course, he didn't do it. It was a... And in the, he dropped her off, took off, and that was the last he saw of her. And he had an alibi, too. But until they came up with somebody, um, they they kept on him for a while. They interviewed him a lot. Um, you know, he did talk to the press. He talked to Aggie Underwood, the uh, examiner reporter, uh, who worked the case for many years. And, uh, you know, the crazy thing is, uh, you know, he was determined not to be... Uh, a viable suspect. He was released, and of course, the papers are are there taking pictures of he and his wife Harriet uh, kissing and making out. It's very dramatic film law photographs. And I look at those photographs and go, "Well, I wonder what wonder what he and his wife talked about that night." Because you know, he, he he was obviously uh, you know he was running around. He, he, yeah, he, he, running yeah, around he, he, he claims, claims the whole girls. time that they're. He claims the whole time that their relationship was not romantic, um, so to speak. Uh, but, yeah, I had heard that he, when they were grilling him pretty good, that he had offered to to take the polygraph. I don't know if he ended up taking a polygraph test. He or... did. He did take a polygraph. Uh, he passed. He uh, They administered sodium penthol, truth serum at the time. In fact, uh he offered to do that in later years, in the early 50s, uh, and they asked him to. Uh, they, I don't know why they kept going back to him, because it was, you know, first of all, he had an alibi. Uh, but they, they didn't have anybody as a viable suspect at that time. They, they administered the polygraph, or the uh, 
truth serum several times to him. Uh, very strange. Uh, I, I interviewed a guy named Ed Gelb, who was a private investigator, and he was hired by the Who Is the Black Dahlia TV movie producers in like 1974 to track down people from the case. And he uh, went and interviewed Red, who apparently was living in a like a trailer park at the time. And Ed told me that when he met Red, he was very friendly. He didn't really know why Ed was there to talk to him. And they had a few beers together. And then when, when Ed said, well, I'm here to, to get a release form for a movie about the Black Dahlia, the Red got really upset and chased him out of the trailer with an axe. So this, huh. this, this case uh, followed Red for many years. So they've they've talked to Red, and he was uh, you know one of the last men to have uh, been seeing her, dating her. Um, where do they go from there? After they clear him, we've got to find somebody else to talk to. Well, it took them some time to clear Red to polygraph him and interview him, and they, they interviewed him for hours and hours. Uh, but one interesting thing at this point is. Uh, you know, this case was starting to become the O.J. of its time. It was post-war. The victim was young, pretty. She came out from the East Coast to Hollywood. But the case was about to get even bigger and more sensational because uh, some reporters checking around the Long Beach drugstore where Elizabeth hung out uh, found out that, you know, it's all, we don't know really where it, where it came from, but somebody had given her the nickname the Black Dahlia after perhaps that movie, The Blue Dahlia, which was playing at the time. She was in Long Beach. Now, again, it's like the, I was the first of the crime scene. No, I was. There was talk over the years who came up with that name, The Black Dahlia. And uh, Jack Smith, an L.A. Times uh, columnist I interviewed, uh, he claimed for years it was him. Then he finally admitted it was a guy named Devo Means, another reporter. And uh, Jack said that when, you know, acknowledging that it uh, wasn't him that came up with the name, giving it away was like giving away the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> but when when that name, the Black Dahlia, hit the newspapers, I mean, it was all over. Back in those days, uh, the papers loved to, to give titles to these murders. In fact, in the 30s, L.A. was called the, the murder headline capital of, California or headline capital, murder headline capital of the world, something like that. And they always seem to have a, a color or an, and a flower, like the white orchid or the red hibiscus. And, of course, when that name, the Black Dahlia, hit a couple of days into the murder, you know, it was pretty much all over. You've got black is dark and mysterious, and uh, Dahlia is a flower that nobody probably really knows what it looks like. Uh, but it, it all exploded and it became, you know, they got more tips and more calls, people claiming they saw Elizabeth Short uh, after she left the Biltmore. They all had to be checked out. Uh, and that was a huge job for the, the police at the time. But there was never a definitive sighting her of her after she left the Biltmore. And Finus said in his tape, and I quote, we also had many calls, phone calls from people that claimed or thought they had seen the girl at different times in different places, and many times the same times in different places far removed from one another. We interviewed thousands of people. We spent three days without any stopping or resting, no sleep, until we got some of the things answered, end quote. In fact, Finus's daughter told me in 1991 that her dad didn't, didn't even have a chance to change his shirt for the first three days. So with, with all the people that Elizabeth Short knew, her... Uh, nomadic lifestyle, her secretiveness, all the people that claimed to have seen her, it became a huge and complex case right from the word go. And uh, after about nine or ten, nine days, the, key, the case seemed to be petering out, at least on the newspapers, when uh, Jimmy Richardson, the city editor at the Herald Examiner, got a phone call. And you're probably familiar with this. It went something like... Uh, he answered the phone, city desk. Is this the city editor? Yes. What is your name, please? Jimmy Richardson. And the voice said, well, Mr. Richardson, I must congratulate you on what the examiner has done in the Black Dahlia case. And Jimmy says, thanks. What can I help you with? And the voice says, you seem to have run out of material. Maybe I can be of some assistance. 
And the person on the phone who Jimmy later described in his biography as being very uh, almost arrogant and taunting apparently revealed uh, a few things about the murder that only detectives would know. Um, and he promised to send in a few things that she, she had with her when she, quote-unquote, disappeared. And uh, the next day, I believe it was the 24th, people say that the, the killer sent the letter to the police, blah, blah, blah. No, he didn't. Uh, it was actually addressed to the papers, and it was intercepted at the Terminal Annex Post Office by a postal inspector. It was an envelope, almost normal size, that had a cut and paste from other newspapers on it that said, here is Dahlia's belongings, letter to follow. And I, I do have to give credit to Larry Harnish, a uh, serious researcher. Uh, he found the uh, the word here from a movie ad at that time. And uh, this letter arrived, and it was uh, a smell of gasoline. It had been soaked, apparently, or washed with gasoline. It was damp inside, and the gasoline, they determined, was to get rid of fingerprint evidence. Now, obviously, if you have the word Dahlia's belongings, Dahlia, on the clipped and cut and pasted and put on the letter, it means the killer is following the case in the papers, which is really not surprising. Right. So the open the, open the envelope and out comes Elizabeth Short's birth certificate, Social Security card, photos, uh, the Greyhound uh, claim checks for her luggage, and an address book stamped Mark Hansen. So Mark Hansen's back in the picture. He claimed later, which uh, apparently is true, that Elizabeth had taken the phone, the address book from his desk and was using it as her own. Most of the uh, names listed in it were in her handwriting. When they opened the address book, they saw that several whole pages had been cut from the book. I've heard torn out, cut out, you know, many different pages. I've also read that it was cut out by a sharp instrument. Depending Regardless... On Depending on Go what ahead. author you read, um, yeah. some some will say that there was one page missing, and some will say that uh, there were many pages. Yeah, missing. ten. It's a hundred. It's all. Yeah, but you know, either way you look at it, there's there are more names in the address book, a lot more names to check out, and of course, the, you know, the other thing we should point out though too is that Richardson did not. Um, that's the editor's name, correct, Richardson? The city editor, right. Yeah, he he chose not to, um, you know, he could have printed in the next day's paper having received that phone call, and he he decided not to, correct? Um, I uh, I don't know exactly how it went down, but my suspicion is Finest Brown and Harry Hansen said don't talk about it, you know, right. don't mention it. Um, let's see if the letter arrives. I mean, certainly he would have told them, especially if the killer had uh, taunted on the phone and revealed details about the murder that only the detectives would know. He wouldn't print that in the papers. That would blow the whole case. So my oh, suspicion is they asked him to keep quiet on that, and when the letter arrived, they went from there. And the letter arrives, the address book is one of the items that is sent. What are the other items? Her birth certificate... Uh, her social security card, photos, Greyhound claim checks for her luggage, um, and Mark Hansen's address book. The interesting thing here is, you know, here comes Mark Hansen in the picture again, and it makes me wonder. Uh, obviously, if you have Elizabeth Short's personal possessions that she had with her when she disappeared, uh, the envelope came from the killer. Uh, putting Mar Mark Hansen's address book or his address book that she had lifted that has his name on it, that puts him on the hot seat, and it makes me wonder, uh, was it deliberately taunting the press and the police, or was this an attempt to, uh, you know, make Mark nervous? I think it's the latter, but we'll get into that. Yeah. Now, more or less from January till March, the, the, the uh, actually the... the the Black Dahlia was front page for 33 days straight. Uh, getting into February and March, it was in less and less. But, of course, Hanson and Brown and many others at LAPD were still pursuing the case. And, in fact, Harry Hanson worked on, on and off until he retired in 1983. And uh, Brown did it as well, minus Brown, over the years. Um, but 
what happened really is Elizabeth Short faded into obscurity, and once every few years, the L.A. Times or the Herald Examiner would do kind of a an anniversary story. They did one in 71 and 1950, 1971, 1987. Usually around January 15th, they'd come out with uh, one of these. Um, but it essentially kind of disappeared uh, and uh, was unsolved. By December 1948, the uh, 192 suspects had been eliminated out of 316 total. By March of 1950, the DA investigation suspect list had 20 of the most promising. By 1951, there had already been 33 confessions, and that grew to, I think, at least 50 or 60 over the years. Um, by this point in my my own writing, uh, the script at this point, I, I was stymied. The police were stymied. In the real case, I was I was at a stopping point. Uh, my story covered the first 10 days of the investigation, kind of petered out. The police had no suspects. I had no suspects. And uh, also keep in mind, I was doing all my research in 89 to 91 without the Internet when I needed to find somebody to interview. It meant driving to the library and going through a wall of phone books from major cities, uh, calling the L.A. Times, waiting for a call back on a newspaper clipping, uh, getting on I don't know how many thousands of dollars I spent on 411 information calls trying to find people. So at this point, I was kind of dead in the water, and my girlfriend, Michelle, the one who helped kind of light a fire under me, told me to kind of, you know, take a break from this case and all your research. Let's go to the Queen Mary, and we'll stay in the July 4th weekend in the hotel down there. So I said, okay. And at the Queen Mary at the time, they had this little uh, store that sold nothing but old newspapers, I mean, really old newspapers, the actual ones, the entire newspaper, Boston Globe, New York Times, and whatnot. And they weren't cheap. They were like 50 bucks. And I'm kind of looking through these newspapers, and there's a headline that says, Nightclub Owner Shot by Taxi Dancer. And I'm reading, Mark Hansen was the nightclub owner shot by a taxi dancer named Lola Titus in July of 49, two and a half years after the murder. So that uh, kind of turned my my research into a new direction. Of course, today I can go on the internet and click Lola Titus, and I'll I'll come up with all manner of Black Dahlia websites and whatnot to talk about her. But back then, for me, this was a huge thing, and I needed to find out more about her and what happened with her shooting Mark Hansen, who was one of the main Black Dahlia suspects who had known Elizabeth Short very well. And uh, the long story short is. Uh, she had stayed with him, I think, November 1948, briefly, so she already knew him, and she showed up in July. Uh, Lola had some, some mental issues, and uh, she told the reporters later that she uh, showed up at Mark Hansen's, uh, quote-unquote, I made up my mind that he was either going to love me, marry me, or take care of me, or I was going to shoot him. And uh, according to Mark Hansen's statement at the time, she did shoot him, and according to his statement at the time, uh, there was no hanky-panky. She just kind of came through the door. He shut the door, and, and uh, she shot him. But she claims um, that they made love, and uh, she shot him afterwards. Now, he was shot in the bathroom, shaving. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but when a, a strange person shows up at my door, I don't immediately run into the bathroom and take my shirt off and start shaving. So, right. yeah, whose story are you going to believe? Um, I did a little research into her. It was a, a little tricky to find out things. Uh, today I'm in touch with her cousin, and he's also on, on the hunt to find out more about Lola. Um, but there were a few interesting things that happened. I, uh, I spoke to a reporter who'd been a crime reporter for the Herald since like 1944. Was it the Herald or LA Times? He was a veteran newsman uh, named Neeson Himmel. And he had a little uh, shop set up at the basement of Parker Center. And I would go visit him, and he knew a lot about uh, all these cases. And he worked on the Black Dahlia, and I mentioned Lola Titus. And he goes, oh, yeah, Lola Titus, uh, crazy fucking broad. I interviewed her in Lincoln Heights Jail the night she was arrested. So um, I got a lot of information from him and from some t court transcripts after uh, she shot Mark Hansen. And at some point... You know, she said that she's very vocal and very volatile, and she said that Mark Hansen was probably mixed up in the Black Dahlia. Now, there are different reports where 
he accuses her of being the Black Dahlia killer, but there's no evidence that she ever met Elizabeth Short. So, again, as usual in this case, lots of confusion. Um, there's so many interesting personalities in this case, and they all have interesting names. I must point that out, too. Um, poor Lola got railroaded. She got uh, sent off to the state mental hospital. Uh, she was at the time, I think. 23, she ended up dying there uh, nine years later in 1950, or seven years later. Uh, anyway, she that was the last place uh, she lived, and she just kind of died there, very sad. But all this uh, information about Mark Hansen uh, put me, or put him on the radar again. I also found it was very strange when I was looking at her court transcripts. One of the papers I found was... Uh, a list of people to subpoena to show up at the shooting trial, and uh, they had various people. Um, Mark Hansen was listed, and the subpoena said unable to find. And I thought, well, that mm -hmm. I know that the LA sheriffs often deliver subpoenas. I believe it was on the sheriffs uh, uh, was the LA sheriffs delivering the subpoena. But I thought it was funny that you know they here's the guy that was shot. That was a very prominent. Uh, successful businessman well known in the community and they couldn't find him uh, so he, he was not at Lola's shooting trial but uh, you know I spent a lot of time trying to find her in fact I uh, was going through all these phone books at the library and I found a Lola Titus in Kansas and I, I phoned her up and I said are you Lola Titus and yes it's an old lady did you live in Los Angeles yes and I thought I was very excited I thought I found Lola's Titus and I said did you uh, you know, no Mark Hansen in 1948 and 49. She says, no, I worked at, you know, I worked for McDonald Douglas Corporation or something like that. So mm -hmm. that was typical of, of my research of trying to find people. You know, at the same time, I, I tried to find Detective Jess Haskins, one of the first officers on the scene, and uh, this one day I reached over and grabbed my local phone book, my white pages, and his name was in there. I couldn't believe it. I phoned him up, and it was him. And he worked, or he uh, lived in a, a rest home not far from me and uh, visited him the next day. I couldn't believe he had a, his name in the phone book after 44 years and whatnot. Okay. So up, up until now, my research, aside from Betty Bersinger, the lady who found the body, most of my interview subjects were cops and reporters, and I was about to get extremely lucky. Now, I don't know if you remember, I mentioned I tried to get a VHS copy of that 1975 TV movie, Who is the Black Dahlia? I couldn't do it a few years earlier. I'd phone the producers and whatnot. But I called them back, and the uh, secretary who answered the phone said, well, you know, there are some archives of one of the producers out in the Midwest, uh, uh, all the paperwork from all this guy's productions. And uh, so I called this university out in the Midwest, and uh, they sent me a list of what they had from this TV movie who is the Black Dahlia, and it, you know, it has a list of what you can check off and you you order what you want. But there were there was hundreds and hundreds of categories and papers to choose from, call sheets, location permits, production reports, budgets, the usual things you get involved in the massive enterprise of making a movie. There was one column that said correspondence, and it said letter to Phoebe Short, letter to Ann Toth. Now, Phoebe was Elizabeth's mother, and Toth was Elizabeth's good friend and roommate right before the murder. So I ticked those boxes off, uh, sent a check, and waited. And after a long wait, I got a package from this university, uh, all the call sheets, all the budgets, and all the stuff I didn't really need. But there was a letter the production wrote to Phoebe Short. Uh, it was basically uh, asking permission uh, they didn't use her real name in the TV movie, but in a release form, they paid her $100 to kind of tell her story, apologizing, you know, for what happened. And then there was a letter to Ann Toth, sort of the same thing. We won't use your name, but here's $100. We're going to kind of tell your story. And it had an address in Reno, Nevada. So this is 1991. It's September, I believe. Late at night when I'm reading all this, and the next day... Uh, I decided to call information. Reno, Nevada, is there an Ann Toth listed? Yes, there was. I got the phone number. So I thought, this is big. I thought, after all I'd been through, I thought, ah, it's probably not her. So 
So I phoned, and an old lady answered the phone, and I said, is this Ann Toth? And instead of saying yes or no, she goes, I'm not sure. Who is this? And I told her my name, what I was doing on Mark Shostrom. I'm doing a research for a screenplay about the Black Dahlia. And there was just silence. She didn't say anything. She didn't hang up on me. So I started again. I said, I've interviewed Lieutenant Freestone, Lieutenant Haskins. I've talked to Finest Brown's daughter. And she interrupts me and goes, well, what about Harry Hansen? And at that second, I knew it was her. And uh, I spoke to Anne first time in September 91. I called her about once a month for three months. And we talked for, I don't know, 90 minutes, one time for two hours. And... Uh, uh, the most interesting phone calls I've ever had, and I, I really wish I'd taped them. I didn't know at the time, you know, how to do that, like you and I are doing right now. And mm-hmm. there are certain things I don't want to reveal right now, but I will in my book, in my screenplay. Um, but the um, most interesting thing was, uh, you know, just just the little things I found out and the way her emotions would go up and down. She was very lucid, very, you know, her her memory seemed to be all together. Um, but she told me she hadn't spoken to anybody about this case in 44 years. Now the, the TV movie producers contacted her by mail, uh, sent her the money, uh, but nobody had come and interviewed her. No one author claimed to have interviewed her in a book, and I can tell you that after talking with Anne, for many hours, over three months, she would have mentioned that, and she never did. Uh, she told me I was the, the first person who called her. Um, I mentioned earlier the photo in the newspaper of her kind of looking like a deer in the headlights. And uh, I found out why that why she had that look on her face. She told me after Elizabeth was killed that she was going out of her skull. That was the phrase she used. And that she had a nervous breakdown afterwards. Um, her boyfriend, Leo, who I mentioned uh told her one day, well, you know, have a drink, you'll feel better, and she did, and she ended up becoming uh, an alcoholic for many years, and uh, eventually she died of cirrhosis of the liver, I believe. So, when I look at people like Ann Toth and Lola Titus, uh, aside from, you know, Elizabeth Short's family, you know, who are obviously, you know, hurting and probably still hurt today from this case, uh, there were a lot of sort of peripheral victims in this case. It's almost like it, it never ended, but it, it took a lot of people with it. And that's mm-hmm. that's one of the things I was starting to feel at this point. Um, one thing that came out with Anne was I, she would talk a lot. She worked in the movie. She'd talk about a certain director she'd worked with and this movie they were doing and how fun it was. And I would kind of have to steer her back. But I had to be careful to do it, how I did it. Because in the beginning, she... You know, she's very guarded. She didn't want to talk to me too much about it. But after she kind of got a liking to me, um, she would open up more. But I had to, I had to tread very carefully because it was very emotional for her to to think about this again. Um, but aside, you know, all these people that read books and speculate on bulletin boards and read newspapers you don't get a sense of the reality of the case, and especially when you're talking to somebody who's so closely involved. And there there are points in talking with her where she'd talk about Elizabeth Short, and I could could hear her crying, you know, not hysterical crying, but I could hear her crying on the phone. And uh, when we got on the subject of Mark Hansen, uh, her voice turned very bitter, and almost the first words out of her mouth were, I know damn well he had something to do with it. Uh, whoever did it was connected with him. And uh, one thing I noticed, Nick, is the conviction in her voice. That was what mm-hmm. stood out for me the most, was her absolute conviction that there was no doubt in her mind after all this time that he was mixed up in it. And, you know, I got his details about various incidents. Uh, for example, Mark Hansen told the police initially that the last time he'd seen or spoken with Elizabeth Short was December 8th, dropping her at the Chancellor Hotel in Hollywood. Well, it turns out, you know, from their investigations, they found out that Elizabeth Short had called Mark Hansen from San Diego in early January, and they'd spoken at least once. 
And you got a lot of different stories from Mark Hansen. Uh, he would lie and be very evasive until they caught him in a lie. And it eventually came out that uh, they, they checked phone records. And Mark Hansen was one of the people that was the short call from the Biltmore a few hours before she disappeared. Now, she was seen calling many people, and I would imagine if you're essentially homeless and kind of at the end of your rope, you're calling a lot of people to find out who can who can help you out, where can I get a place to stay for the night? And he was one of the people she called. Mm-hmm. Um, Antoth did tell me about uh, her arrival uh, a day or two after Elizabeth Short disappeared. Antoth was up in uh, Sonoma, California, Richmond, the Sonoma area, Northern California for Christmas. And the last she'd heard from Elizabeth Short was Elizabeth Short had... Uh, asked Anne to to send her $20. Now, I presume this is like a Western Union wire because you could send money by Western Union in those days, and you wouldn't necessarily know where somebody was at the time. You you know, you have to put a name on the form, but you don't have to say where, where you are. You can send the money to Western Union. You can pick it up anywhere. So Elizabeth Short got the $20, but the point I'm making is Anne Toth was up north, and she assumed... That Elizabeth Short was going to Berkeley with her sister, as she told several people. So Ann Toth arrives after Christmas, January 10th, I believe it was, to Mark Hansen's house where she was still living. And uh, she told me the conversation they had when she first walked through the door, which was like, Ann says, hey, Mark, where's Betty? And he goes, uh, I'm not sure she is. She was in San Diego. And that's when Ann Toth came out with the famous quote, which is in the papers, San Diego, I thought she was going to Berkeley. It sounds like the wrong way Corrigan. Now, the wrong way Corrigan references in the papers, and she actually told me that phrase when she related the incident to me on the phone because I didn't know who wrong way Corrigan was. I had to call my mother, who was like the same age, and ask her. Is some uh-huh. flyer who kept ending up at the long, wrong airports or something like that. But um, Ann Toth did tell me you know, a lot of details about uh, Mark Hansen and Ann Toth. Uh, and it was more than just a yen for her. She was, or He was very jealous of her. Um, he really wanted her in a big way. And he was, as, to quote Ann Toth, she said, Mark Hansen was not an above, more, above board man. Um, there's a lot to this. Um, I mean, when you're talking suspects, Mark Hansen has always been a suspect. Uh, he was a suspect with Harry Hansen and Finus Brown with the DA investigation, uh, uh, you know, the reinvestigation of the case in 1949, 1950. He was a, a prime suspect for many years. He was not the only suspect. Uh, a lot of people have come out with books and are coming out with books where they claim various various doctors, various people were her Elizabeth Short's kill her. But uh, many of them don't have uh, one thing, which is there's no evidence that many of those suspects even knew Elizabeth Short or even met her. That's the one thing we know about Mark Hansen is he knew her. She lived at his house. They had a very sort of, I'll call it a dysfunctional relationship. I don't know the ins and outs of it, uh, except for what I I read in the DA papers, the newspapers at the time, and from what Anne told me. But I tend to believe Anne in her uh, in her conviction that Mark was involved. That he really he really had uh, he wanted to to make her. I think was the the words he used. And uh, to me, that's very telling. Um, Do I think he did it himself? I asked Anne that question. I, at one point, I, when I really got to know her and felt comfortable to to bring the subject up, I said, do you think Mark physically, physically killed Elizabeth himself? And she said to me, and she paused, and she said, he was too chicken shit to do something like that. But huh. whoever did it is connected with him. And again, when she spit it out with such, I won't even say venom, I'll say conviction, uh, to me, that was very telling. I mean, she was there; she lived with them. Uh, you can you can have all the theories and uh, speculation in the world, 
And it really doesn't mean anything unless you have you know, a confession, unless you have eyewitnesses, unless you have evidence. And here we are, 69, almost 70 years later. It's going to be hard to find, you know, yeah. a lot of that. There's there's no confession so far. Um, witnesses are almost all dead. Evidence, it's in the LAPD uh, files. Even some of that has gone missing over the years. Um, it's it's too far gone to to definitively prove who did it. But at this point, all we do have is is speculation. Um, I don't know if you read the article by Michelle Dean in the New Yorker a few weeks ago about true crime addicts. No. Uh, I'll paraphrase. It was a really good article that came out a week or two ago. She said. Uh, Crime addicts rarely, if ever, solve crimes. They're drawn to the most dramatic possibilities and ignore more tedious solutions. Cold cases of long attracted hangers on who work for years on quote unquote solving the crime but never do. The result is complicated morass of uncontrolled speculation. It certainly isn't justice for the victims or their families. Uh, it's a really good article, I have to say. I'm a bit guilty of this. I'm also drawn to it, but at the same time, I've always tried to be to be truthful uh, about the facts of the case and respectful of the fact that, you know, these murder victims, and Elizabeth Short in this case, she's not just some face or name in an old article, but she was somebody's daughter, somebody's sister, somebody's friend. She still has relatives alive. And I've always tried to be respectful of that, and I know a lot of Authors make a, a lot of money off of publishing books, which are, you know, quite the opposite, shall we say. A bunch of interesting stuff that Mark is pointing out, and a lot more that you guys dive into in part two. There's more suspects to discuss, and there's also some weird stories that Mark's going to fill us in on. Plenty more to talk about. Look for part two coming out, I believe, tomorrow. A big thank you to Audible.com and Casper Mattresses. Uh, make sure you support the people that support the garage. Yeah, so later this week, 